thank you all for coming. We're really excited um, to have Dr. Langhall speak to us today about uh, handoffs in the operating room to the ICU, figuring out how to spread and scale an intervention. Um, when I was preparing some a brief introduction for Dr. Langhall last night, I was looking at her website, which I highly recommend you all visit at langhall.info. It's, I think, I found a lot of inspiration on how to promote yourself as a clinician, as a researcher, as an you know, individual working in many different areas. Um, and to that point, Dr. Lane Paul referred to herself on this website as a critical care anesthesiologist interested in improving healthcare communication, which I think is something we all can identify with in our various roles. Uh, Dr. Lane Paul got her Bachelor of Arts in Molecular, molecular and Cellular Biology and, inter and Interdisciplinary Studies at Berkeley, um, University of California at Berkeley. In 2006, got her Doctor of Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine. And in 2013, got her Master's of Science in Health Policy Research at the University of Pennsylvania. So, according to Megan's website, she considers herself having eight jobs, which I think, again, we can may identify with many of these. She's a proud wife and mother of two girls, uh, board certified in anesthesia, board certified in critical care medicine, a mentor working with undergrads, medical students, residents, and fellows. Uh, and a researcher, of course, we're researching teamwork and communication in perioperative and critical care space. She's also a teacher, uh, teaching medical students, residents, and fellows about anesthesia and critical care, and a writer. Um, and I know I actually follow Megan on Twitter. I highly recommend you look her up. Her Twitter handle is at uh, mlangefall, no hyphen. Uh, and lastly, university citizens. So uh, Dr. Langefall. He is an assistant professor of anesthesiology and uh, critical care at Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She's co-director of the Penn Center for Perioperative Outcomes Research and Transformation, a uh, member of the leadership team of the Center for Healthcome, Healthcare Improvement and Patient Safety, and also senior fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute and in Health Economics. Uh, so with that, I will kind of hand it over to Megan, let her take it from there, and uh, welcome. Thank you, and thanks everybody for having me. Very excited to be here and to talk about a project that we're all doing together. Um, welcome <laughs> to the project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a project looking at handoffs from the operating room to the intensive care unit. And just so I know who we've got in the room, how many of you are clinicians in some capacity? So half-ish? OK, great. Um, so I'm excited to speak to a mixed audience. And if anything is not clear, you know, there are lots of assumptions that I have gathered over the years from clinical practice. So if something seems like you don't you don't know, just ask. Oh, and I stuck the VI over there on my slides too. So. <laughs> yeah, brandy. Okay. So I have a few objectives for this talk. The first one is that I want you to be able to describe what's called a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial, which is what I'd like to do here. Identify elements common to handoff standardization strategies for the operating room to ICU handoffs that I mentioned. And then I have some objectives for you all. First, I'd like to get some ideas about the approach <coughs> to the project that we're proposing, and then some ideas about what the right outcomes are to study for this project. So don't have any financial conflicts to disclose. The work that I'm doing and that I have done has been funded by the agencies that are up there in white, and then in the sort of green, gray, I have been funded by the other agencies up there. So the case for handoff, since we have a good number of non-clinicians in the crowd. When I say a handoff, I'm talking about a transfer of patient care and accountability. So this is the idea that we can't, as clinicians, be in the hospital all the time. We wouldn't necessarily want to be in the hospital all the time, and our patients would not want us to be there because we would be tired and cranky. So we have to, in order to ensure continuous patient care, transfer that accountability and that responsibility for patient care between ourselves. And part of that involves exchanging information, but also talking and having a conversation about what's going on with the patient. And that process is called a handoff. So my husband is not a clinician. He is not in medicine. And I've had on occasion to explain to him what it is that I do. And it's a little bit tricky to talk to someone who doesn't live in a clinical world, but we did have a parallel when it comes to cooking. So my husband is from West Africa. He cooks. God bless him. And he cooks <laughs> these lovely one-pot meals, um, so these fabulous peanut butter-based stews with tomatoes and onions, and it's just really good stuff. But the one night he makes us this dinner, it's We're going to come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> and he would love to have you. And he would love to have you. So if anyone wants to come down, it's spicy. It's spicy. Um, 
so he makes this wonderful meal, we have a great time, we go to bed, and we wake up in the morning and the pot's still on the stove. And all of the leftover food is in the stove, is on the pot, um, in the pot, and at this point is spoiled. And so we have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and so I say, why didn't you put away the food? Because I'm, I'm wanting leftovers, right? I can't have it. Why didn't you put away the food? And he goes, I cooked the food. You're supposed to put away the food. And I said, we never talked about that. And I said, that's a botched handoff. This is what I study. <laughs> so, we think about preventable harm in healthcare. It's very, very common, and I think that this audience understands that message. There are an estimated four to eight million preventable adverse events in healthcare every year, and an estimated 440,000 preventable deaths that are associated with those preventable adverse events. So, if you look at the lead, leading causes of death in the United States, um, we have the heart disease and cancer are big players, and then some other important ones here. But if you put healthcare-related deaths in that list, it ends up being number three. And you could argue about the numbers, you could argue about the methodology. What is clear is that we do cause patients harm in the process of trying to get them better. And so there's an imperative for us to think about how do we deliver healthcare without causing additional harm on top of that. When the Joint Commission looked at adverse events in healthcare, they found that about 70% were related to communication problems, which the clinicians won't be surprised by. The handoffs were implicated in about half of those. So we know that this is an important area to look at. We know that a lot of our preventable adverse events are related to the communication that we conduct on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is really what drove me to get interested in this. I, I observed that you put a bunch of very smart people into a room and suddenly they can't talk to each other and things that seem very simple fall apart quickly and patients get hurt. So the thing that drives me to study this is how do we how do we conduct this relatively conceptually straightforward process and make sure that patients get the care that we think they need and deserve. If you look at handoffs across the continuum of care, this is an example of a surgical patient, bless you, uh, who is going from their primary doc to a surgical clinic going to use the mouse for the folks that are remote. So you might start off with someone who has a surgical problem and they're in their primary care office. And the primary care doc says, you need to go to a clinic. You need to see a surgeon. So they go to the surgical clinic. And the surgeon says, okay, we need to do surgery. So you go into the hospital and maybe it's a big surgery and something happens and there's a lot of blood loss or you need to be monitored closely. So you go to the intensive care unit and then you go to the hospital ward and then hopefully home and follow up with your primary doc. Every time you move, there's a handoff. Every time you change settings, there's a handoff where information is exchanged and the care plan is supposed to continue on, but there's an opportunity there for something to happen. And within each of these boxes, there are also handoffs happening as the clinicians that are providing care to you are coming on and off. So every time there's that exchange, there's an opportunity for harm. So there are a couple of basics that I want to cover first. One of the challenges in studying handoffs is that we have multiple kinds of them. And so as we continue on this discussion together, we should use some precision about what handoffs we're discuss discussing. Most of the handoff research that's in the biomedical literature is interested in shift-to-shift -shift handoffs. A lot of that is focused on residents, so physicians in training. Some of it's focused on nurses, and then other types of professionals as well. And these are handoffs in which you have interchangeable actors. So the idea is I'm working, I'm getting ready to go home, I'm going to hand off to another physician who knows what I know, ideally, um, has the same knowledge base, the same understanding, and they're going to do the same job that I did. So the, the goals of that and the requirements of that handoff are different than, say, a transition of care, which I describe as moving from site to site. That's the operating room to ICU handoff that I'm going to talk more about. That's when you have a patient who is moving from perhaps a team to another team, in the case of the OR to ICU handoff, you have a surgery team, so a surgeon, an anesthetist, and a nurse, and handing off to an ICU team. So an ICU nurse, an ICU provider, a respiratory therapist. They have different backgrounds, they have different understandings, they have different priorities. And so the communication challenge across that gap is a little bit different than a shift-to-shift -shift transition. And then there's something else that's called a duty relief, where um, you're, taking, you're handing off a patient, but only for a short period of time. In the operating room, it could be as short as five minutes. In the case of a subspecialty con consultant service, it could be a weekend. The communication challenge there is, how much do I need to tell you, and how much of an exchange do we need to have so that you can take care of this patient safely for a short period of time? And how do you balance efficiency with completeness? Another complicating factor in thinking about handoffs is that they have multiple functions. And uh, Emily Patterson and Bob Weirs wrote eloquently about this in the Joint Commission Journal 
when we think about handoffs, clinicians especially, we think or tend to focus on information. What do you need to know about that patient to take care of them? And while that is a really important function of handoffs, it's not the only one. So as we engage in this conversation, we're also transferring accountability. We're saying that you are not responsible for that patient. We're also thinking about the patient together. And the clinicians among you may have had the experience of, as you're handing off a patient, you think, oh wait, maybe this isn't sepsis. Maybe this is a PE, or maybe it's, maybe it's something else. And just the process of having the conversation helps you realize something about the patient that you, didn't, you wouldn't have realized without the conversation. And that's a really important function of handoffs. And it's also a way to socially interact and to build social norms so that we talk about what's appropriate care. And you can, if I try to hand off a patient to you and, well, why'd you do that? Didn't you think about this other thing? And oh, I should have done that. You're right, there was a protocol that you followed. So there's, there's this social interaction piece to the handoff as well. For the most part, the studies in the biomedical literature that look at handoffs look at negative things, but there are also some positive elements that go back to that distributed cognition and social interaction. <coughs> this is building resiliency into the healthcare system. This is potentially helping patients in the process of handoff by creating a team that's really thinking about them and coming up with a plan as opposed to relying on just the judgment of one person or a small group of people. Handoffs can fail for a lot of reasons. So human factors, Kristen? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying not to um, compress your, respect, your whole area of expertise into four bullets, but, but you did. I did, just for, just for the sake of brevity. But she's the expert. So we are human. We have limitations. One of them would be fatigue, so we can't work constantly. We start to not be able to process information as well as we get, as we get tired. And so our, in, our ability to interact in a handoff may be compromised by fatigue. We tend to get overloaded by information. And so if you think about, if I have a patient with 10 comorbidities, and I try to tell you verbally about all 10, you're not gonna remember them. There is a limit to the number of things that we can hold in our short-term memory. And so we have to think about, how do we support information exchange, given that people have limitations on cognition? We also can develop a false sense of security where you think you know what's going on. So let's say I'm in the operating room and I'm handing off to another anesthesiologist and I say, oh, this is a straightforward lap coli, no problems, and I leave. Um, that's, it may be enough, but it may not be enough. We may think, okay, well, I am so expert, I am so skilled, I can handle anything, so I don't really need to hand off because I'll be able to figure it out. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it falls apart. Systemic factors are important in handoff quality, and so if there is no standardization, then information exchange and that whole handoff process can fall apart because we don't really have any expectations about what it should involve. So if there's a missing piece, we don't know because we have no framework in our head to say, oh, well, you covered A, B, and C, but you didn't cover D and E. If there is no A, B, C, D, and E, then you don't know. There's also a problem with lack of reinforcement. We can tell residents and nurses and people in training, we can say handoffs are really important at the beginning of orientation, and then if they're with us for 10 years and we never mention it again, <laughs> guess how much they're gonna think about it. And then there are communication failures. So we can forget to say things. We can say something that's wrong and perpetuate uh, a problem with information. So for example, last week I took care of a patient in our ICU who reportedly, he was in our ICU with a trach with vent-dependent respiratory failure, and the word on the street was that he had had a trach before, and so it was a very complicated tracheostomy because he had had a trach before. And only after talking with his wife for <coughs> really just a few minutes, um, after he'd been in the hospital for a week and a half, she goes, he never had a trach before. Like we, I'm, I'm sure, and she could describe his previous illnesses, and think, oh, okay, that was, I'm sorry. It just sort of got passed through the grapevine, and that can certainly happen. And then there are differences in clinical knowledge. So. Um, I'm an anesthesiologist in the operating room. Yesterday, I was working by myself as what we call a direct provider. So no resident, no CRNA, it was just me. But a resident came in to relieve me. So if I'm handing off to the resident, what I understand about clinical medicine and what my expectations are are very different than what that resident's are. So when I hand off to that resident, I need to get in their head and think, what do they know? What do they expect? What do I need to explicitly say to this person because they have less experience than I do? that I might not have to say to an attending. So if I don't think about that, then I could be setting up the patient for them. And then we have complex patients. So this is a axial CAT scan from a patient I took care of at Critical Care Fellowship who was 
pregnant and had placenta procreta, where her placenta was growing through her uterus into her bladder, and had pulmonary emboli and right heart failure. There's a lot going on with this person. And so the more complex our patients get, the more difficult it is to hand them off effectively. So as we think about handoffs, there are some unresolved questions. For me, I think about, well, how are handoffs related to adverse events? We have the sense that they are. The Joint Commission tells us that they are. But what's the mechanism? What's the causal pathway? And is standardization a strategy? We think about checklists and protocols and standardization, and it sounds good in some ways, but does it actually improve patient outcomes? So a few methodological points first. I talked about why studying handoffs is problematic. Confounding is one issue that I'm not going to talk about today um, because it, it tends to be more of an issue in looking at shift to shift handoffs. But I do want to talk about rare outcomes. So the parking lot question for you for our discussion for later is what are the right outcomes to study? And I'll take you through why some of our classic outcomes are a problem. But I want you in your head to think about what would you want to know if you were reading a paper about handoffs and you were trying to be, the, the author's trying to convince you that it's either important or that their intervention did something, what are the outcomes that you'd want to see to really be confident that they did what they said they did? So the rare outcome problem. Our favorite outcome <laughs> tends to be mortality. Why? It's binary. Right. <laughs> it's usually pretty easy to figure out. I did once declare someone dead as an intern that was not dead, and I could tell you that story. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> my resident was complicit in it, too. It's a very interesting story. But in general, it's pretty easy Awkward. to tell whether someone, <laughs> whether someone has died. Um, the problem is, when you think, and I think a lot about perioperative care, overall <clears throat> operative mortality is quite low. And the, the mortality that you can actually attribute to a handoff is even lower. So how many of you are familiar with Swiss cheese? Hi, you guys know about Swiss cheese. All right, so if I think about harm on the one end and patient on the patient over here, there are lots of potential barriers to prevent harm from reaching the patient, but if there are holes in those barriers, then it's more likely that the harm will actually reach the patient. So if I think about, let's say if there's a patient who has a difficult airway and I'm evaluating them as an anesthesiologist, one potential barrier from harm reaching the patient could be the EMR. So if the EMR, when you open up this patient's chart, has a big blinking screen that goes, difficult airway! That's good, right? So we know and we make the right provisions for it. But if the EMR has a tiny little asterisk somewhere in the middle of the screen that no one can see, then maybe nobody does see it. And it's in there somewhere, but you can't see it. And so harm can get a little bit closer to the patient. Maybe as an anesthesiologist, I evaluate the patient and I say, have you ever had any issues with someone putting in a breathing tube? And the patient goes, yes, I'm supposed to tell you about that. And so they do, and we go, OK, and I'll make the appropriate, the appropriate um, intervention, the appropriate plans. But maybe someone else did the pre-op. And then the case got moved into my room. And all I see on the pre-op is that they have hypertension and diabetes. And I go, OK, I know how to handle that. But the difficult airway thing never comes through. And maybe harm gets a little closer to the patient. Well, maybe we go into the operating room. The patient's airway gets secured. But I need to go home now. And someone else is coming in to relieve me. And I forget to tell them that the patient has a difficult airway. And then at the end of the case, they extubate the patient and get into trouble. And they can't re-intubate the patient. And then harm gets a little bit closer. But if I had a handoff checklist or some sort of template, I would go, oh, wait, yeah, airway, yeah, no, that was a big deal, and we did this, this, and this. So think about that when you take out the breathing tube. Or maybe if we have standard airway equipment that always allows for the idea that someone may have a difficult airway, even if all of these barriers fail and I get into trouble, I go, oh, well, I have a bougie and a jet ventilator, and I've got a surgeon with a scalpel, and I've got all these other things, we can rescue that patient. But if I don't have that standard airway equipment in the OR, then maybe harm does actually reach the patient. So there are lots of different ways that harm can reach patients. The handoff is just one of them. So the problem with studying a handoff is I could have a perfect handoff or an almost perfect handoff, and the patient could still have harm. Or I could have a horrible handoff, and the patient could be fine. So when you look at our outcomes, how do I confidently attribute handoffs to outcomes in an observational study or in an interventional study, how can I convince you that whatever I did to improve the handoff actually helped the patient? So one strategy for that is looking at composite outcomes, which is often considered grouped together. You guys know this well. So maybe we don't just look at mortality. Maybe we look at things like reintubation, or if we can think about a way that a bad handoff might lead to acute kidney injury, maybe through fluid management. We look at that, and then we look at MI, myocardial infarction or heart attack. If we group all of these outcomes together, then we increase our power to detect an effect. But again, going back to that parking lot question, 
is this a is this a plausible outcome? Is this something that makes sense in this world? And that's hopefully a discussion that we'll continue to have. So let's dig into operating room to ICU handoffs, which is going to be a test case for implementation science. So these handoffs, this is a patient who has had surgery, and they're being transported directly from the operating room to the intensive care unit. And the reason that that happens is either that the patient is actively having physiologic problems, so their heart rate is going up and down, their blood pressure is going up and down, they're bleeding, there's something acutely wrong with this patient and they need ongoing intensive care, or they're at very high risk for deterioration. So maybe they had a big surgery where they had an abdominal aortic aneurysm repaired and you're worried that they might bleed and you need to follow them closely. So you don't stop in the recovery room, you just say, no, I'm going straight from an intensive environment to an intensive environment. So you move the patient from the OR to the ICU. What happens is when you move that patient, you're also moving technology. So you're moving monitors, you're moving arterial lines, you're moving potentially pulmonary artery catheters. Maybe they have a lumbar drain in their, in their spine. Um, and so all of that movement presents physical risk to the patient. And then you've got these different teams that I alluded to that need to talk to each other that come from different backgrounds. And they also have different priorities. So if you think about an operating room team that's moving this patient from the OR to the ICU, they have other patients in the operating room they need to get back to. So they can't spend forever in the ICU making sure that the handoff is perfect and that everyone has a shared understanding, or at least this is one thing that they might think. The ICU, hand on, the ICU team, on the other hand, has a unit full of sick patients that they need to attend to, and so they can't spend forever in the room with the surgical team saying, okay, do we understand exactly what's happening? Everybody's got another priority, so they come together for this brief period of time, and they have to communicate effectively in that brief period. The, if this doesn't go well, there are some consequences. One is that the patients can get injured because they're being moved. We can get injured, and I've had the pleasure of rolling a bariatric patient in a 600-pound bed over my foot. Always fun. Um, thankfully, I did not break anything. The patient can deteriorate physiologically as they're being moved. So you imagine if you're navigating a large bed through the hallway, it's sometimes hard to look at the monitor. It's sometimes hard to figure out, is the patient's blood pressure what it should be? Is their heart rate what it should be? There's this risk period where the patient can deteriorate because you're just trying to get them from A to B. There can be medication errors that happen if the patient was supposed to get a medication in the OR um, that they didn't get, or if there's some sort of plan for continuing a medication if that's not appropriately communicated. There can be missed information about what the target blood pressure is, for instance. So if we go back to that abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, um, scenario. Vascular surgeons tend to have a, a narrow range of blood pressure that they want to tolerate. So you want appropriate perfusion, so you want high enough blood pressure, but you don't want it so high that you compromise the integrity of the repair. So if that doesn't get relayed to the ICU team, then the patient could suffer harm. And then the teams could get very frustrated if they don't have a shared understanding of what it is that they're supposed to do or talk about. So OR to ICU handoffs, um, they're important because they're high risk. But they're also a model system. And this is one of the reasons that, as a researcher, I like them. So you can think about basic science researchers and their mouse model. It's not that they care about the mice. I mean, maybe they care about the mice, but that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to understand a fundamental process and translate that into people. So I sort of think about the OR to IC handoff as my mouse model. It's important in and of itself, but it also serves as a model to understand how clinicians communicate with each other. And it's convenient, sort of like a mouse model, because we know where it's going to happen, we know when it's going to happen, it doesn't take too much time, and so it gives us this opportunity to really study what happens when people come together. And if we understand that, we may be able to export that to other settings and improve communication in other parts of the hospital. So that's really one of the reasons that I like this particular handoff, um, because you do have vulnerable patients, but also hopefully it's a test case for learning more about communication in general. So if you think about OR to ICU handoffs, you might say, well, this is just a communication issue. Why not just do a checklist? We've had lots of success with checklists. Atul Gawande has written very eloquently about this in his book, The Checklist Manifesto. Peter Pronovost has shown that when you implement central line bundles, that central line associated bloodstream infections go down, and everything's wonderful. Um, but those same studies that have shown that checklists work, if you try to implement them somewhere else, people have shown that they don't work. So Peter Pronovost's study, was try they tried to export it into the UK, nothing happened. The safe, stu safe Surgery Saves Lives checklist that showed a decrease in mortality through the WHO when it was implemented in Canada showed no effect. So it might be that the checklist is necessary but not sufficient. There's something good about checklists, but those the checklists by themselves are not the answer. 
So how do we think about improving processes? There is some data that supports handoff standardization, and this table comes from the IPAS study. Have any of you heard of the IPAS study? I see a couple of nods and a couple of shakes. So um, the IPAS study group is a multi-center group that's interested in improving handoffs. <coughs> they started in pediatric resident handoffs. So going back to our taxonomy of handoffs, they're studying shift-to-shift -shift handoffs in pediatric residents. What they've done is create a handoff bundle where they teach residents how to do handoffs. They teach the faculty how to evaluate the resident handoffs. And they have an acronym called IPAS. And I don't remember it because I never remember all the acronyms, but it's something about illness severity and the synthesis and basically if I went through the curriculum, I didn't know it. But um, it's a bundle of things that you do to improve the handoff. And they showed that when you implement that bundle in nine different hospitals across the country, you decrease preventable adverse events. And they showed about a 25% reduction in preventable adverse events. This is probably the most rigorous handoff study that's in the biomedical literature. It was published in the New England Journal in 2014. Um, very, very well done. This is close to a gold standard now when it comes to thinking about handoff research. But, but they're sort of the beginning of pointing to if we standardize handoffs, maybe you can improve preventable adverse events. So this was done as a before and after study? Was it was done as a before and after. And so that's one of the conversations we may need to have is that it's very difficult to randomize something like this. And you're working at the level I've been storing of, up that question. What's that? I've been storing up that question for you. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to randomize a provider level intervention. So you have to think about potentially cluster randomizing. And so randomizing perhaps at the level of the unit. But then you get into problems with are the patient populations equivalent? And then you have to increase the number of centers to really detect that. There, some people have thought about using stepped wedge approach, where you implement something in a few centers, and then you wait, and then you implement in more centers, and then you wait, and you implement in more centers. And statistically, which you guys could help with, um, you can figure out how much of the change is related to the intervention when you look at the change in the outcome over time. But, but this is one of the challenges, is how do you study this? So if you look at OR to ICU handoffs, there have been a number of studies done, all single center studies. But what they do find, they're all, almost all done in cardiac surgery, which is a very homogeneous patient population, and almost all in pediatric cardiac surgery. But what they did, what they all did, was standardize the handoff process. And I'll show you how they did that. And they did find that their process outcomes, specifically information exchange, improved. There was one study that looked at uh, patient outcomes, time to extubation, and cardiac arrest, and they did find that that improved as well. But most of these studies don't look at patient outcomes. So one of these studies in particular I want to focus in on, what they found was that information exchange improved with standardizing the handoff, that provider satisfaction improved, that the handoff duration was unchanged or perhaps even shorter, and that medical errors decreased um, and sort of depended on which, which topic area you looked at, but for the most part, medical errors decreased, and that goals like extubation might be reached earlier. So if I zoom in on this particular graphic from uh, Craig, what, you, what you're looking at here is a percentage of errors. And so what you want, if the errors are decreasing, is for the bar to regress down to zero. So the pre-intervention error rate it, are the dark bars. And the post-intervention error rate are the light bars. And you can see that after intervention, all of them come back with the exception of weight. I don't believe this was statistically significant. But across a number of different information elements, and again, they're focusing here on information. Across a number of information elements, you see that the information transmission improves with standardization. It is pre-post. So if we think about a conceptual model, if we think about why standardization might help, the way that I think about it is that if you are able to standardize this process, you may see improvements in teamwork. And we can talk about what the metrics should look like for that. Teamwork is conceptually related to communication, but it's a little bit different. But if teamwork and communication both improve, then ideally you see an increase in appropriate care. And again, we could talk about what the metrics are. Continuity of care and provider outcomes like satisfaction and burnout, which ultimately should lead to improved patient outcomes. So to drill down a little bit more, um, what we're talking about here is if you improve teamwork, which you could measure with something like a teamwork performance score or a team member presence or body language, and you improve communication, which you can measure with information omissions, accuracy of information transmission, and handoff quality, then you may see an increase in appropriate care, which you could measure as errors in care. Continuity of care, which you could measure in, let's say, diagnostic redundancy. So does someone get an extra chest x-ray, or does someone get an extra dose of something they weren't supposed to get? And 
can, can measure provider outcomes like burnout satisfaction, engagement, and safety culture. And then ultimately, hopefully, you're increasing, improving patient outcomes like satisfaction, pain, <coughs> length of stay, infection, delirium, mortality. So, if you look at all of the published studies for that examine OR and IC handoffs, there are some common features. So, what they tend to do is they choreograph the handoff. So, this goes back to the question of is a checklist enough? All of these studies used a checklist or a template, but that wasn't the only thing they did. They also created an expectation for what people were supposed to do and when. So they created a choreography or a dance of the handoff. So what all of them had was pre-handoff preparation, so there's some sort of communication between the operating room and the ICU before the patient ever arrives. The patient arrives in the ICU, they're stabilized, so if they're mechanically ventilated or put back on a ventilator, everyone makes sure that their blood pressure, their heart rate is okay. There's technology transfer, so all of the wires that come along with the patient are transferred to the room. And only at that point do people start talking. So all the team members coalesce, they exchange information, they use some sort of tool that has shared elements on it. They take turns, like kindergarten, so they don't talk all at the same time. They have a discussion, they ask questions, and then the handoff is done. So this brings me to some of the work that we've done at Penn. So if you hear me say hat trick, um, hat trick stands for handoffs and transitions in Christiana care. Sandy Schwartz has tried to convince me that I can make this handoffs and transitions in Christiana care. So we'll see what you guys think about that. <laughs> um, this is a screenshot from our website. But before I get started, I do want to make the caveat that we did it there at Penn does not mean that we should do it here at Christiana. So what I mean to do by sharing what I found at Penn is to give you a little bit of insight into how I thought about this but I'm very cognizant that this is a different institution. That's actually why I'm here, and that's why I hope we can have a productive, collaborative relationship with each other, because there are differences, and I think we can learn from those differences. So I come in peace. Um, <laughs> my goal here is to learn from a system that functions very well. The fact that you all exist, the fact that the VI exists, means that you care about quality and safety and rigorous measurement. So what I want to do is learn from you. I want to learn from a system that's based in the community because the patients that are seen here and the pressures on practicing, the fact that you have com community clinicians that are here, that's really important. And so understanding how to think about communication in this context has much more relevance to how we deliver healthcare in this country than a tertiary academic medical center where everybody is sort of there all the time. I want to build generalizable evidence, so I want this work to really speak to a different number of settings, and so the more different the settings are, the more we can learn and hopefully build that generalizable evidence. And I want to get people excited about thinking about safety. Um, this is something that really drives me. I think that at our core, we all want to deliver high quality care, and so hopefully I can gen up some enthusiasm. So I want to recognize my team at Penn that it took to do this work. These are just my collaborators, my faculty collaborators. So the point of putting all these folks up here is that it takes people with different types of expertise to do this kind of work. So I've got a medical anthropologist who works with us, who's helped us with the qualitative methods, surgeons, intensivists, um, a clinical nurse specialist, and um, an implementation scientist. So all of these folks have helped me think about how to approach this issue. And then my team, who actually did data collection. So we are not going to have the same team here. So Kristen, one of the things that we're working on is how can we do this? How do we actually, um, be, how can we situate ourselves in the clinical environment, observe what's happening, collect data, um, and do it efficiently without having 20 people? Mm -hmm. Now, the, what I've done at Penn and what I hope to do here is structured is what's called a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial. So how many of you have heard of this? No. Good. I'm so excited. So how many of you are familiar with the concept that when we study something in an ideal setting in a randomized control trial, <coughs> it takes a number of years to get into clinical practice? Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I see head nods. So maybe as long as 17 years mm -hmm. to go from your ideal study to actual implementation. The idea behind a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial is that you are studying both the effectiveness of an intervention, but you're also studying how to get it into practice at the same time. And so the idea behind this is to try to shrink that interval from evidence generation to implementation in practice. And it's broken out, this trial type is broken into three types, where you have different levels of emphasis on either effectiveness or implementation. So in a type one hybrid effectiveness implementation trial, you're still trying to figure out, does this thing work? 
So this is what I've done with the work at Penn. Does standardizing OR to ICU handoffs actually improve information exchange? We found that it did, and I'll show you, but it wasn't clear that you could take what had been studied before and do it in a mixed surgical ICU, which is what we did. So if you take a heterogeneous surgical population across two hospitals, can you standardize information exchange and, and see it improve? At the same time, we collected information about implementation. So do people like it? Do they accept it? Do they adhere to the process that we created? What are the barriers to accepting and adhering to the intervention? So we're collecting data about implementation, but the focus of the intervention is not the implementation, it's the actual thing that we created. As evidence moves on, and perhaps here, um, we'll end up doing more of a type two trial, where we say, you know, we're pretty sure this works, Let's see if it works here, but let's focus on, if we're gonna implement something, let's focus on that. How do we actually create buy-in and engagement, get people excited, implement this thing, and figure out whether people are doing it? Moving on, once you know that it works, your focus might be, how do you get it to work? So maybe you do a randomized controlled trial, but the intervention is the implementation. So you say, we've got the, we've got the intervention to improve handoffs but maybe we randomize people to online training versus in-person training, or we randomize them to, if they do the handoff well, they get a cookie versus not. But you're looking at how do we get people to do it? That's the focus of the trial. So that's a type three. So the study that we've done, um, because it is a hybrid effectiveness implementation trial, has a few different measure types. So we've looked at intervention measures. So this is the, these are the effectiveness measures and we've looked at implementation measures. So implementation constructs include things like acceptability. Do people like the thing that you're asking them to do? Do they think that it's appropriate? Do they actually do it? And when you think about causal pathways and does improving the handoff lead to improved patient outcomes, you have to figure out whether they're actually doing the thing. And is it sustainable? So you can put a lot of effort into creating an intervention, but if people don't continue to do it, then you are gonna see a, dim a diminution of effect. And then cost is also important. We, are, we also structured this as a mixed method study, so we've got both qualitative and quantitative methods. Our primary outcome for the study at Penn, which is not gonna be our primary outcome here, was information omissions. And that put us in line with all of the other studies that had been done in this space, was looking at, do people communicate more? Here, what I'd like to do is actually look at patient outcomes and power the study to look at patient outcomes. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to do this study here. And Kristen and I have had a number of conversations about what are the right outcomes, how do we study them, can we get them, what's in the EMR? But that's one of the questions too for you is what do you want to see? If you're reading that paper, what's going to convince you that this thing worked? What patient outcomes um, should we be focused on? I'm going to skip over qualitative stuff. Um, just in the interest of time, but I'd be happy to tell you about qualitative research. The process that we designed at Penn, and again, this is not what I'm bringing here, this is just to give you an idea of what it looked like. We created the handoff choreography, so this is our dance. So what we did was create an expectation that people had some communication before the patient arrived in the operating room, so this goes back to what the other studies did as well. When the patient arrives in the ICU, there's an introduction of providers that's led by the primary nurse. So the idea here is that people need to know who everybody else in the room is so that they can engage as a member of the team. You stabilize the patient, make sure that they're breathing well, and then transfer monitors and technology by secondary nursing staff, where secondary nurses are the ones who are not involved in the handoff. So the idea is that you've got extra nurses on hand who can focus on untangling spaghetti that came with the patient, while the nurse that's receiving the patient can participate in an exchange, in a, in a conversation with the surgeon, the anesthetist, and the ICU ordering clinician. Then there's a huddle of clinicians, a huddle of providers together, and the nurse says, is everybody ready? And then the surgeon starts, the anesthetist goes next, the ICU provider leads a discussion and says, okay, these are the concerns, this is what we're gonna do. Everybody looks at the patient together, and they exchange contact information and an opportunity for questions is offered. We also have a template similar to what has been published before, but our template is very different because we have a heterogeneous surgical population. So when you've got a cardiac surgical population, almost everyone has been on a bypass circuit. Almost everyone has an arterial line, maybe a pulmonary artery catheter, they may have pacer wires. They've been through very similar surgical stress, and so it is straightforward to say, these are the 30 elements you should cover. In contradistinction, when you have a trauma patient, an ear, nose, and throat patient, an OBGYN patient, they're all very different. 
And so we faced this concern of, do we create a 60-point checklist that will cover everyone, or do we create something that's much more free form and allow clinicians to talk about what they think is important? Given the culture that we had in our ICUs, we said, let's go with the latter, because if we create a 60-point checklist, no one is going to do it. So what we found in our initial observations was that when people were in the room paying attention, the communication was actually pretty good. And so the biggest part of our intervention was getting them in the room and creating this expectation of having a conversation together. So to help you visualize it a little bit more, what we started with was two different handoffs. So the patient would arrive in the ICU room, in the, quite literally in the hallway, the surgeon would be talking to the ICU ordering provider they would um, come out of the room and have a conversation. <coughs> At the same time, you would have an anesthetist that was talking to the ICU nurse. And so you've got two different handoffs with some parallel, parallel information, but some things that didn't overlap. By the time the ICU nurse was done talking to the anesthetist, they turn around and the surgeon would be gone. And so lots of opportunities for missed information. What we ended up creating at the end was this expectation or this situation where everybody's in the room, you have secondary nurses who are connecting the patient to monitors. You have the anesthetist talking to the respiratory therapist and then they turn around and they come and they're part of the huddle. And so everybody's in the same room having one conversation. What we found when we standardized the handoffs is that we saw an increase in information transmission. So the number of elements on this list increased. Now the interesting thing to me is that we didn't tell people what to say. We just said be in the room and have a conversation that you think is relevant to the patient and yet they talked about more of the things on our list with just that expectation. We found that the number of people in the room increased, which is not surprising because we asked those secondary nurses to come in. However, we did find that the handoff duration increased, which um, is potentially a problem. Now, when you look at the literature, most of them talk about a handoff duration of about eight minutes, and so we increased to that average. Um, but I think especially in a setting that is interested in efficiency, Increasing the handoff duration is probably not a great idea, and so I'd have to think about it. We'd have to think about ways to support clinician workflow without adding additional time, unless that time was recouped somewhere else. So here we are. Um, so Penn is where I work in Philadelphia. Coincidentally, this dot is where I live, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> it actually takes me as much time to get here as it does to get there because of the traffic. All right, so you know your hospitals. Um, we're interested in doing this work both at Christiana and Wilmington. We're talking about how to sequence this and should we think about both hospitals at the same time or one first? I think probably we're leaning toward Christiana Hospital first, but um, there are some opportunities at Wilmington to understand how they approach this process as well. Our outcomes, the composite adverse event I envisioned as our primary outcome. So this goes back to the idea of looking at composite outcomes to increase power. But um, I'm going to finish up in a minute or so. I'd like us to talk a little bit about what outcomes you think are useful and if you would trust a composite outcome. If you did, what should go in it? If not, then what are the outcomes that you would like to see? But we'll also be looking at IC mortality, mechanical ventilation duration, and the other um, elements on this list. The rationale for doing the work here, we talked a little bit about generalizability. Uh, you are a behemoth in this area, and so we can capture the majority of the care that happens in Northern Delaware, which is really appealing from a generalizability standpoint. And there is a mix of both hospital-based and community physicians, which again is appealing from a generalizability standpoint. And what we'd like to do is power this study to detect changes in patient outcomes, which will then allow us to do a larger multi-center RCT, probably a cluster RCT, um, but that, that's the ultimate goal is to spread this even more. So the approach, we initially envisioned this as a grounded theory approach, so looking at qualitative and quantitative methods, um, which we do want to do eventually, but in discussions with Kristen and with Dr. Hicks, who's the chair of medicine, and with Dr. Schwartz, we're thinking now of using a case study approach to developing an initial understanding of how the different ICUs approach handoffs. So we would do three to four case studies where we look at one patient and one handoff but try to develop a complete understanding of what's happening in that handoff. So that means following the patient, being in the operating room, following them from the operating room to the intensive care unit, interviewing everyone who touched that patient, looking at their EMR, looking at every note, every artifact that was generated, and really trying to develop a full understanding of that handoff. Do that in multiple ICUs, 
and also potentially at Wilmington, and look for the commonalities and the differences, which would then inform our approach to future observations and understanding what some of the challenges are to effective communication in the different ICUs. And then we'll move on to the grounded theory approach where we're trying to build theory about how clinicians communicate. The, the interesting thing here is that we don't have any effective measure of communication quality or handoff quality, so we don't know if it's being done well here. If it is being done well, that's great. And what I'd like to do is create some sort of metric. You're shaking your head. <laughs> I love it. He's like, no. Um, but, but just being open to the idea that maybe you figured it out. But just, just knowing whether you figured it out is useful and having some way to audit your performance is useful. And I think that would be a contribution to the literature to say we developed a way to determine whether we do this effectively. If you are doing it effectively, why? And how do we keep it going? If you're not, then what are the opportunities to create an intervention to change practice? Maybe it's just a little nudge to get people to do what you want them to do. Maybe it's a big intervention. But this is, we're taking a stepwise approach over three and a half years or so um, to look at how this process is approached here and to understand how to support people in the work that they do. So that was it for my prepared comments. Questions? Yes. Well, you know, it's fabulous. It's fabulous work, and you really thought about this very, very well and very, and, uh, very deeply. Um, and I'd be happy to sit down with you sometime and discuss uh, methods if you, if, if yeah. you like. So, um, uh, in favor of randomized trials. At the end of at the end of the at the end of the day, in areas like this, we really do need randomized trials because the problem the problems with observational studies, as you were well well aware, are just are, are, are so so difficult. Um, one line I, uh, I like, any observation that's been made in an in a observational study relative to, to treatment choices is probably wrong. Um, so that's a little humility uh, training for, for us who do comparative effectiveness research. Sure. Um, and in particular, in the area of ha handoffs, I think one of the things that, you, that, that, you, that you'll have is a Hawthorne effect, that in some areas of observational studies you, 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 you won't, but sure. naturally in this you, 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 you will, it's going to watch out for it. The other thing about, uh, I make a comment about um, composites. Rather than just have straight composite, which one of the pots do they have, think about two alternative uh, approaches. Uh, one would be weighted composites. The, the, the other is the win ratio. Okay. You, yeah, I don't know if you know about the win yeah. ratio yet, but you know, it's just something that we should discuss all, sure. offline. But so, it's, a, it's an approach to, to uh, composites that falls short of, uh, of weighting. Um, the problem with with um, uh, the the um, uh, win win ratio uh, is uh, that um, it only takes you only get to have one event. If someone has multiple events, you can't count them. In in weighted composites, you actually uh, uh, actually can have multiple events, and that's the other thing to think about is is you sure. multi multiple events. How do you handle it if people have three compared to if someone has has uh, has one? So I would definitely, in, comp uh, in composites, think think about um, creatively about design. I've just written an editorial recently about this. I'll, I'll try to remember to send it to you. It has all the different approaches. There's one thing I want to mention about the Hawthorne effect. It's definitely an issue here. What we've done in the work at Penn is use video recordings to see whether people are doing what they're supposed to do when we're not there. And we're still analyzing that data the f by the first pass, it looks like people aren't doing it. And so, you know, we'll camera in with our telemedicine cameras, and then we'll hear people go, are you guys ready to hat trick? And there's no one there from our team. <laughs> That's great. Um, which is useful. The other point about the Hawthorne effect is there are some folks who think it doesn't matter. Not that it's not real, but that maybe we should create an expectation that people are being watched. And if yeah. that does influence behavior, then maybe that becomes part of the intervention. Yeah, but the problem is it's very it's very hard to systematize a fourth sure. effect, sure. and that's that's why I'd, I'd be skeptical about that. Okay. Um, really wonderful approach. I think your your framework um, is just very elegant, mixed, you know, laid out. So very good job. Um, I, I a couple of comments I, I on the, the conceptual model of, of the uh, your your approach to the composite. So the conceptual model you built there was great, and relative to your composite outcome, what I was what I would like to see maybe when you ask as a reader, like what would be interesting. One of the challenges I think when we, when we review a study that has a, a, um, a um, 
composite outcome is that you know that they're, they're doing what we all are trying to do, which is get a better outcome rate so we can have some yeah. tests, right? Yeah. But then, if, you know, then when your outcome number is driven maybe by, predominantly by one of them, yeah, that, exactly, I love that. Um, mm -hmm. That you, wor you worry about how to interpret that. So yeah. what consideration I would say is because you're looking at many things happening here and that many of them are important, but like uh, I would almost say like, you know, I, I almost say recommending not, you know, not challenging you to power to patient outcome, but, mm -hmm. but including outcomes that are binned as a, com as a composite outcome by different aspects. So the process bin of composite outcomes. So that you're looking at process measures. Okay. And, then, and, then, and then maybe you, you only tag one that you, is like your primary, but really be specific towards a process outcome, a patient outcome, and then even a provider outcome. Like yeah. what, what if, you mentioned the time. You know, maybe the provider satisfaction is up, but the time is longer. But maybe that time going longer is okay. Maybe that was an appropriate increase from three to eight. Maybe three was inappropriate and really not enough for some of these complex patients. That's what I like to think. Yeah, but also, <laughs> but also, the, I, I would wonder what that range is too. From three right. to eight, you know, maybe your, your distribution is pretty wide because there's a simple That's patient true. who is two minutes still, right. and there's that multi, you know, comorbid patient who is there for twelve. Right. And maybe that's appropriate to have that difference. And I'm gonna, I mean, we, you know, we can't put these. You know, sometimes there's less limitations there. But I think that outcomes, if if you do that, that might, I'd be interested to see that. That way, yeah. you're not driving me to say your outcomes, oh, you know, you had this great rate, but you, you've picked one from patient, one from process, one from provider, and they're all going, you and know. sort of testing the conceptual model. Uh, each, at each of those So areas. if the patient outcomes improved, but the process outcomes didn't, then was it Was that lucky? Right? Exactly. Was it just lucky? Yeah. But you would ideally like to see it all along the way. Yeah. Um, in terms of the handoff to outcomes, so usually, you know, they're, there are the detail points that you cover during the handoff, which is great, but usually you don't know how it's going to go until it's gone. Sure. Um, and you're the provider taking care of them, and you're the one that's kind of picking up what was left off. So have, have you done any um, interviews with the providers who were handed off to yeah, we have. after the fact? We have. We've done interviews and surveys, and most of our ICU admissions are done by advanced practice providers, so nurse practitioners and physician assistants. The nice thing about that is there's a small group so we can get all of them. What they've told us, at least from their impressions, is that they spend less time after the admission finding data. And so that may, mm, they may actually recoup great. some of that time that they spend mm -hmm. in the room because they talked about spending in excess of an hour. Who do I call? How do I find them? What is this? What's the blood pressure goal? What's this? What's this mm -hmm. drain? Was the output always green? And so they have all of these pieces of information. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. I mean, I think some of those downstream consequences even after the handoff would be useful. Like Just process after you, the fact. Yeah, things that you can't necessarily pick up in the EMR. Right. That are more qualitative in I actually just want to go back to Bill's point now that he left um, <laughs> about um, systematizing the, the Hawthorne effect. So I am the infection control officer for the hospital, so we think a lot about the Hawthorne effect sure. in relation to hand hygiene. And there are um, there have been some products that have been marketed where they have they put cameras throughout the unit, um, and they're obviously focused on the in door uh, entry point of the unit, so they don't interfere with patient privacy. But and then they, the cameras are always on, but they're only monitored, you know, 10 minutes out of every hour, okay. and it's random, you know. So the, the folks know that they're being monitored because they know the cameras are there, but they don't know at any particular time whether, whether they're being monitored. Really there. And so, and they found that that actually really increases. And then, the, you know, there's they had ways of, of feeding back that information, like your hand hygiene compliance for the last hour, last day, last week was mm -hmm. such and such a percent, mm -hmm. and that kind of constant monitoring and feedback was very effective. Of course, you know, the system cost like $100,000 per unit, so it wasn't really very feasible. But I was just thinking, you know, most of our ICU rooms have the um, e-care cameras. Right. Um, and you could potentially design something where, you know, the OR calls e-care saying we're about to transfer a patient to room X. The camera's right. on. It's actually not in the surgical ICU. Yeah, I know it's not every ICU, but, it, you know, <laughs> some of them. So, so you're going. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you could, you know, <laughs> You could potentially have a place where, you know, there. We just don't use it. Okay. the camera is on. It may or may not be yeah. monitored for the handoff per but se every concept. single time, but you'd have a, a way to sample. That's great. Megan, that was, that was fantastic. Thank Coming you. from someone who lives this every day, uh, the only time I go to a handoff as an attending trauma surgeon is when the ICU nurses are in tears because the CR CRNA is being an asshole. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, uh, trust me, we don't do it well. 
I, I can probably promise you that. I saw Ryan shaking his head. Everybody. Uh, it, it, you know. Um, we are exactly like that picture showed. And I think just getting those two people in the same room will, will like, you know, that, that's the low hanging fruit, I think. And that may be the most important thing. Yeah. Just get everybody in the room, uh, talk one at a time. So uh, a couple questions. Uh, I, I love the composite outcome, and I like taking it a step further. Maybe a composite outcomes with uh, adverse events, provider satisfaction, that, that sort of thing. Um, the uh, I, I know Jose very well, and, and I'm sure him and his partners don't have an 8.3 minute attention span. They're not in the room. Yeah, they're, they're not, not in the room. room. So I guess that's one of the questions. Are you talking? Uh, you would keep it at the. CRNA nurse, or, or, or is your expectation of pen now is that the attending surgeon is at that handoff? No, I mean, because that's hard to do for us. It's very hard to do. I think it goes to what are the organizational expectations and what makes sense from an organizational yeah. standpoint. If you look at most pediatric cardiac or an ICU handoffs, it's all hands on deck. It's the attending anesthesiologist, it's the attending surgeon, it's yeah. the attending intensivist, yeah. the fellows, the residents, the nurses, everybody. <clears throat> in most adult settings, from what I've seen, that is not the case. And so what we did at Penn was say, we're not going to change who is supposed to be there, we're just going to change how they interact with each other. So sometimes the attending shows up, but the most most of the time it's not. So it's a resident, it's a surgery resident, yeah, the operating an resident, anesthesia resident or CRNA, CRNA, and then the ICU nurse and an ICU admitting clinician who's either a resident or an advanced practice group. Yeah. And I'd be happy to help you, you know, offline with some of the uh, events that I was, but I'm sure you've already thought about it. Well, no, more input is better. Well, 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 what they would be. Great. We talked about a case yesterday in our M&M and &M a patient who they decided to, uh, you know, put together their, their bowel during a, their first uh, trauma laparotomy. Mm -hmm. And the patient was on pretty substantial doses of pressors, and the surgeons didn't know it. Wow. You know, oh. and it, would, it would have changed their their management, sure. you know. So that's another thing to think about studying is that ether screen interaction between surgeons nice. and anesthesiologists. And that's one of the nice things about doing these observations is that you can you can look at how the process works and maybe it's that more attention should be paid to communication in the operating room. Yeah. And that once that is better, then the post-operative communication is a little bit easier because everyone's got Absolutely. a common understanding. Yeah. Right. Is there a question I, well, this, this was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, so I'm in the medical ICU. I'm one of the attendings, and we're always trying to get better at communication and how do we do this? Do we have huddles, et cetera, et cetera? Um, this is a interprofessional effort. Um, so you you definitely need you know the surgeon, the intensivist. You need everybody's input. When you were starting all this, who do you consider? What profession? do you consider to be the go-to expert on communication? I don't know that I do consider one. I think what I thought about was who is part of this interaction mm -hmm. and who who is meaningful to those people. So if I'm thinking of in the room, I've got an ICU nurse, who does the ICU nurse report to? Who does the ICU nurse learn from? Who are their influencers? Whose judgment do they care about? And I think, well, it's their boss. It's the nurse managers. It's the clinical nurse specialist. It's the leadership of the ICU. And so you, I sort of thought about each person in that interaction and tried to get stakeholders that represented all of those different perspectives. At the same time as I got people who had the methodologic expertise to help me figure this out. So Mike Best is going to laugh at me when I ask this question. I think you probably know what you want to ask. But um, is there a psychologist involved in any of this? Oh, no. I'm just thinking because that's the kind of, and I'm not one, and we have uh, a pilot going on in our unit with a behavioral health provider, but you know that's that's somebody who's like completely removed from the trenches that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. A a unbiased person who knows how to, knows how we work, and oh maybe maybe you should have said things this way, or maybe you. Know, I that's don't know. Great idea. Just looking at things from a completely different perspective. You're right, and that's that's some of our. So the the qualitative expert, qualitative and mixed methods expert, Fran Bark, brings a little bit of that because you have to explain to her she's not a clinician at all, mm -hmm. and so you sort of have to explain what's happening. And she goes, well, what? Why did you do this? And why don't they do that? And what? So, in the explaining, it sort of points out issues with right. the process. But you're absolutely right that having more 
input from people that aren't steeped in it can help create insights. And I, I'm, I'm going to channel Seema Sanan yeah. and, um, and echo what I think, kind of back to what um, Bill was saying, is that the, the power of that randomization and just to, to talk about that, I think that we can and, and, yeah. you know, really hit that head on because one of the things that I think that you're, this, the power of that science that it's so just, it just takes out all the things that you usually have to control for with these advanced statistical models that are so advanced that the people that read them don't understand them, right? I mean, let's be honest, like, yeah. you know, I've, I've, I've had you know, my own colleagues help me out, I'm like, I'm not sure we just did, but that's great, you know? So, to that end, the randomization, what if, you know, what if we, if you can design this in a way where it flips on its head and says the target is not the patient, we are actually consenting and randomizing our providers. Yeah. And the providers are who are, are, are the target for this intervention with, with standard care, usual care being the norm, the control, if you will, the blind. And then the other ones, when you're starting the intervention, lets you randomize. So you don't have to necessarily cluster or unit, because that takes away we, you know, the, the, the control about the, the patient's severity and, and heterogeneity would be impossible to compare a surgical ICU to a medical ICU, right. even that, right? Even so I think, know. Kristen, that's something we'll have to talk about. There's a huge risk for contamination because you've got teams that are coming together and forming at each interaction. And so you can imagine if you intervene on one person, they join the team, and then the next person goes, oh, that seems like a good idea. And then in their handoff, even though they weren't. Right. But I, when I, was, I was thinking about that because of the Hawthorne effect. But sure. I was thinking about if you have a tool, and the tool's only introduced at the randomization point, Mm -hmm. and not otherwise. That allows you for, the, there could be a cultural change that, that might right. occur, but that tool is non-existent. And, and, and that could be at least a part of that, and, you know, this is something to think about and start yeah. to put our minds around, but we've talked about this concept of saying with, with uh, decision support software, right? The patient is not the target. Right. It's my docs. It's my, it's my team. It's, it's and, I, and, I, and I don't need my patients to even, they're not going to understand that whole process, but yeah. randomizing who sees and doesn't see or that intervention, that, that, that handoff process, you know, it's really a cool concept. And I think, I think it allows you to get good science there because I think you can do it with that, with that appropriate randomized controlled trial oh, in, you know, in intra-unit where that they, they're they're doing their usual thing. All of a sudden, now they're intervened on, and they, and they recognize up front they've been consented way before this is going to happen at some point. You know, we should, so. we should talk more yeah. about the potential there. Yeah. So two two quick comments. One is uh, you're totally on target with cognitive psychology is where this teamwork and communication comes from. So we tend to look in medical literature, but it's all in the cognitive <laughs> right, psychology right, literature, right. Um, which um, was seized upon by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and became Team Steps, if for some of you have heard of that. It, it informed some of that work as well, uh, which is where this iPass mnemonic came sure. from. Um, secondly, I would caution about that randomization strategy, because we've done little, tiny, rapid cycle tests of change, for example, debriefing after code blue and it spreads which is a good thing yeah. but it yeah. spreads in a way that it wasn't targeted to this this or this clinician or this 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 it's the, because they were to code last week and this thing happened and right. that leader goes to the next code and says let's make this thing happen that i yeah. saw and, last I'll, and week. i'll tell you the way we address that in one of the trials that i just did worried about uh, hawthorne effect of that and that and that kind of like the the cultural change where everyone's following that, even if you're not in the trial, was that you do an observation period and then you do a match control to your intervention. So then if you do your intervention, you do a two to one ran, two to one randomization of intervention to control, mm -hmm. and then your your pre your pre intervention work can then be mixed in there as part of it. So you can do a the statistical models will allow you to have a control group here that should be the same, you'd hope, but if there didn't, you can actually compare and test that. So imagine you have a, let's say six months of observation, just see what happens, and that's your control, then you do a two one randomization intervention to control, and you would hope that that control doesn't change. If it does, you've, you've, done, you've now actually put numbers to the metric of that change in the culture that's already happening. If it doesn't, then you've verified your concept, and you say this is a true control group. So it's, there's some tricks you can do, I think, to allow it, but the power of saying, like, in this one institution, you know, in this one scenario, and if it is a tool-based thing, it allows you, that, that, I think, a cool, just, like, way in where you can say, it's not just a tool, but it's part of it, and that represents with the team, and that and that and they're well aware of being watched and they're being you know kind of observed. It it could you know, I don't know. I, I hear you. I hear, totally hear what you're saying. Absolutely, but I think it's you know something to think yeah. about so we could put our mind on it and start think, you know work it out. And that's and that's part of the reason I'm here, so we can put all of yeah. this together and figure that out. Yeah. Um, there's something very appealing about that. I do I do share your concerns. I think there's probably a way to meet in the middle. Mm -hmm. I don't. If there is an intervention that needs to be done, it's probably not just a tool. 
but you could also imagine, you could intervene just as at the level of the nurse and say, this is your room, this is your patient, we're gonna work with you to create an environment where there's a good handoff. And maybe you, that you randomize the nurses. And you do it all at the same time. So that, you know, yeah. your, your data collection period is very short, but um, we should talk to them. Attention, please. Stroke code, second floor. I think house. we're actually over yes, time. Yes, two, two, eight, one, but seven. I'm gonna be here. Right. If, if attention, please. Thank you so much for your attention. Stroke code, second floor. Thank you, Megan. Tower,